By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing against a Joe, also known as the Crouton Man, and I believe he lives in the UK at the moment. And he is bringing a budget reanimator deck to the table. And this is really, really interesting. Like reanimator is one of those things that, you know, maybe you've always wanted to play it, but it's just so expensive if you want to go full on, right? You got to think of Bazaar of Baghdad, Oh Hollow's Eve. But now Joe is bringing a budget list to the table. So I can't wait to play against this. And I'm actually playing with kind of a new brew. It looks a little bit about the mid-range green deck that I had before. This is called Meekstone green and um, I'm playing with one of my favorite cards in this deck, Living Lance. So I, I'm really, I hope I get a Living Lance on the table for this matchup. Uh, before we go to the actual action, like always, I will start with the deck decks. I've got beautiful pictures of both of these decks, but if you want to skip that, no problem. You can check the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of them reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. And for here, we are going to continue uh, with the deck deck and I'm going to start with the deck of my opponent Joe. So let's take a look at his reanimator list. Here we go. And here we see the deck of my opponent Joe aka Crouton Man and he's brought a very interesting deck to the table. It is first of all it's a budget friendly deck as you can see most of these cards are reprints. If you've got a small budget and you don't want to play you know your aggro monocolored deck then this is a great option for you if you want to take it a little step further. This is a pretty difficult reanimator deck to play, uh, but it is budget friendly and I think it's really, really cool. And I see a few of my favorite cards in this deck, one of them being Hell's Caretaker, Sage of Latinam. Those are two cards I really enjoy playing and it's really nice to see them in your deck, Joe. Um, so before uh, we go into everything else, just just take take a look. Let's take a look at the colors we see black we see blue um, the deck is called rise of the machines and that's probably because of the big artifact creatures that we find in this list right we've got fortress scallions three tetravas and two colossus of sardia now this deck is a reanimator deck what does that mean that means that what joe wants to do is he wants to get his big casting cost creatures in his graveyard as fast as he can and then he wants to use cheap spells like animate debt to get them back from the graveyard and into play. So what you always do when you're trying to assess a deck like this is you're trying to see, okay, how is he going to get his big creature spells into the graveyard? Well, one of his main plans is using the Mind Bomb. So Mind Bomb, it's one blue to cast, right? It deals three damage to each player, but this is the weird thing about Mind Bomb. You can discard a card to prevent one damage and you can do that up to three cards. So you can also decide to discard three cards and prevent three damage. Why would you do that? Well, if you if you have a reanimator deck, that's a pretty good reason why you would want to do it. So in an ideal situation, Joe is going to play Mind Bomb turn one, okay? Then he's going to discard all his big creatures in his hand. So maybe his Triskelion, his Tetravus, his Colossus of Sardia, he's gonna put that in a graveyard. Then in turn two, he can play his anime debt for one block and one, and he can ideally get back a Colossus of Sardia. That would mean he would have an 8-9 Trampler turn uh, two on the battlefield. Now I'm saying 8-9 because anime debt takes away one point of the power. So it's not a 9-9 anymore, but an 8-9. But who cares? It's turn two. You've got it. <laughs> that would be, Joe, I'm really hoping that you're going to succeed in that because that would just be awesome. And then maybe in turn three, you can play one of those Dance of Manys Two blue, a card originally from the dark that allows you to make uh, a token copy of any creature in play. So you would have a 9-9 Trampler and an 8-9 Trampler in turn three. That would just be sick. That would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, now, there are a couple of other tricks in this deck. Now, first off, you also have the little book, Jaloom Tome, which allows you to draw a card and then immediately discard a card. So Jaloom Tome is another one of those enablers that is gonna help Joe put his big creatures in his graveyard. Then besides the anime debts, he also has uh, his Hell's Caretakers in his deck to kind of get his bigger creatures into play. Now Hell's Caretaker is a very interesting card. You don't see it that often. It's one black and three. You can tap it during your upkeep and then you can sacrifice one of your creatures and then in return you can bring back a creature from your graveyard, right? So 
The whole idea is you sacrifice a small creature and you get back a bigger creature from your bin. For example, a Triskelion, right? Now, the cool thing here is that uh, uh, Joe is also playing with Tetravis. Now, Tetravis is, of course, a 4-4 flyer for 6, but the 4-4 flyer is 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters. And during your upkeep, you can take any number of those counters off of Tetravis and make them into 1-1 flying Tetravites. So that means that you can play your Tetravis, next turn take off the counters and turn them into creatures, sacrifice one of those 1-1 one, one flying creatures to get back a really big creature like a Trike or a Colossus or maybe another Tetravis that's in the bin and you can kind of create a loop. Now the cool thing is you also have a Sage of Latinam in this deck which works really well because Sage of Latinam says sacrifice an artifact uh, to draw a card. So you can have a uh, situation in the game where you have a Triskelion, you deal 3 damage by removing the counters from the Trike then you sacrifice the trike for a card, and maybe you use your health caretaker to turn after to sacrifice the sage and get the Triskelion back. So there are a lot of like funny little loops and synergies in this deck. Now, of course, the problem is, and that's why it's a budget brew, you know, that's usually what you see in a budget brew, is it's not as streamlined. It is a little bit janky. You need to have a little bit of time, you need to have a little bit of luck. Uh, and I hope, I really do, Joe, I hope that you're gonna get the time and you're gonna get that luck against the deck that you're playing today. You are kind of, I guess, kind of lucky because I am playing mono green, but it's not the kind of mono green deck that you probably expect it to be. So I am going to give you some time to do your thing. Um, you know what, let's uh, let's just go over to my deck and have a look now. Um, feel free to absolutely pause it here and have another glance at Joe's deck. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Joe's deck, Rise of the Machines. And now we're gonna go and take a look at my deck, Mixstone Green. And here we see my deck. I am playing with green Mixstone today, and this deck is built around the card Mixstone. And also, my wanting, my longing, I guess I should say, to build a green deck that's not aggro green. I wanted to build mid range green, control green, and I'm still trying to find the right strategy. You know, I've tried multiple decks, and this is just another variation. Uh, I do really like Meek Stone because a lot of creatures in green, a lot of good creatures in green have power two or less, so they are not affected by the Meek Stone. And kind of that is that base idea that I started building around. I thought, okay, Meek Stone, that's this artifact, very powerful. It says any creature with power greater than two does not untap during their untap phase. I think that's just incredibly powerful. And if I didn't simply play with creatures that have power or two or less, it is not going to affect me. Sometimes magic is really simple. And uh, then I thought, okay, why isn't anybody playing Mixstone? I think the main reason is Sarah Angel, right? Sarah Angel, 4-4 four, four Flyer. You see it in a lot of decks. Beautiful card, good card. You can attack with Sarah Angel. It doesn't have to uh, tap. It stays untapped, so you can also def use it as a defender. But also, it's not affected by Mixstone. A simple way to solve this, this uh, problem is IC Manipulator. So I'm playing Mixstone, I'm playing IC Manipulator. That's kind of the control element in the deck. Then I'm also playing with Tracker. So Tracker, very interesting creature from the dark, one green and two. You can pay two green and tap it to fight another creature, right? It's gonna deal damage equal to its power to another creature and it's gonna get that damage back. I think Tracker in this build can be really good. Imagine having a Mixstone and an IC tapping down all the beefy creatures of your opponent. And then the small little creatures that remain can still be very powerful, right? And very dangerous. But there is where Tracker comes in. I can use Tracker in combination with Wailoli Wolf, make my Tracker uh, into a 3-3 and basically kill any or most of the creatures that uh, are not being tapped down by the Meek Stone. So I kind of have this control situation going on. I'm also playing with four Thicket Basilisks and two Cockatrice. I think Cockatrice is underestimated. It's just a 2-4 flyer that can kill anything. You know, I think it's quite strong. 2-4 Thicket, I'm going to use it in a traditional combo with the lures. You can see two lures in this deck. Now, besides uh, besides that, there is another really cool card that I'd like to highlight here, which is Living Lands. Living Lands, I'm a big fan of the art. I'm a big fan of what it does. And uh, I know it's not ideal, right? Uh, it's one green and three for an enchantment that turns all your forests, well, all the forests in play, into 1-1 one, one creatures. I just think that's hilarious. So kind of my dream scenario is to kill my opponent with a Living Lance, right? I want to play Living Lance, attack with my entire forest, and just, you know, 
trample all over my opponent. That's kind of the goal. And of course, I've got Pendle Havens to make my 1 1 forests into 2 3 creatures. I also have got the Walulu Wolf again to make them even into 3 4 creatures. So I think there's a lot of fun that you can do. Now, obviously, when you're playing Living Lands, you've got to be very careful because you're turning your lands into vulnerable 1 1 creatures, right? So you only want to play Living Lands to kind of finish the game. So um, to help me get all these different combo pieces together, uh, I'm also playing with two Sylvan Libraries. I really need that. And I've also decided to play with Stream of Life because I just think that Stream of Life is a beautiful card. And you know what? Maybe it can buy me some time when I'm low on life and I just need a couple of extra turns to do my crazy shenanigans. So I'm really looking forward to casting my Stream of Life as well. I just think it's like beautiful art by Mark Poole. It's, it's just this traditional card when you see it when you read the text is easy to understand it's for me these kind of old school cards make the game interesting okay enough talk about the decks this is my deck Meekstone green um let's go to game one and see how it's going to unfold if i'll be able to play my living lands and maybe beat joe with it and if joe's able to get a colossus of sardia out in turn two i think both scenarios will be hilarious so here we go let's go to the match Game number one, Joe is sitting on the left and I am sitting on the right. So let's see, Budget Reanimator versus Meekstone Green. There is a land, no turn one play for me, no land or else. And there's a Mishra's Factory by Joe. Oh, those annoying factories. Can I find a Crumble? At least I can find a Sylvan Library here on turn two. That's pretty good. That will help me find maybe a Crumble or at least some kind of blocker. Let's first see what Joe's going to do. Another Mistress Factory. Okay, he's going to swing in here for two, so I'm going to drop to 18. So some early pressure. And what I really like here uh, for Joe's position is um, he's dealing early damage, meaning it's going to be harder for me to pay for life with my Sylvan Library, right? Also deciding not to do it here. Just playing another Forest. I this is pretty painful. Another Forest and go. Hopefully I've got a Crumble in hand. I'm playing two main. Looks like he's activating his factory again, pumping it to a 3-3, going to drop to 15, so I guess I don't have a crumble. So this is a lot of early pressure here from uh, from Joe, and that's really good for him. Paying for stream of life, not ideal. I mean, I know we just started the game, but this is already a little bit desperation mode for me. I'm going to 18, that stream of life, it's going to buy me some time. Maybe I'm thinking about, you know, I've got Sylvan, so 3 life is almost a card. Maybe that's kind of my strategy here. Um, animating both of the factories, hitting me for four, so I'm going to drop to 14. And let's see what I can find here. Really need to get some blockers on the battlefield. Tapping four. Okay, and I see. That's not too bad. With I see, I can tap down one of his Mishra's factories. And uh, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to do it in his upkeep. So I'm going to tap in his upkeep before he gets to draw a card and decide what he wants to do. So... That makes it difficult for him to make a decision what he wants to do with the uh, the tap mana. Deciding not to use it in this case. Animating his Mishra's Factory. So I'm going to drop to 12 here. At least taking 2 damage instead of 3 because I tapped down that uh, Mishra's Factory early. And untapping everything. I mean, I still got the Sylvan going. I can look at the first 3, right? I should be able to find something useful. Another land. Not playing out anything. Just 6 basic forests. Again, tapping down the factory, but I mean, I'm on 12. He's probably going to put me on 10. That's exactly what he's going to do. Now, remember, his deck's got, what, what was it again? Four trikes and three tetravis. There is a flower stone. So if he can get six mana, and he's got six mana next turn, he can start playing out some bigger creatures as well. And I'm already on 10. Oh, going to drop to six. You're drawing an extra card. That is mighty risky. I wonder what I have. Okay, finding at least a blocker. With the Lanawer Elves stepping down his Mishra's Factory again. So that Lanawer Elf may be useful. Perhaps I have a Giant Grove in hand? Let's see what's going to happen. Ooh, he's going to tap 6. Going to drop to 19, playing a Triskelion. Oh, bad news for me. With Trike, he can shoot down my Lanawer Elf that I just played. And I think I paid like 4 life to get it on the battlefield. Using a giant grove now so that it doesn't die. I mean, that's kind of cute, but it's not going to save me. Because now the giant grove is played. Lanawar Elves is back to a 1 1 again in my turn, and he can still ping it to death if he wants to. And passing turn again, it seems, or not? Yeah, passing turn. Oh, this is so painful. It looks like I'm, I'm finding a lot of forests and not a lot of creatures. I mean, one 
Thicket Basilisk would be a huge help in this current board state. Swinging in here with a 3-3 and a 2-2. Deciding to block the 3-3 here. So I think I should go down from 6 to 4. Right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. So I'm on 4 life. Uh, I mean, it's looking very good for you, Joe. I think you're going to take this game one. And I think the two Mistress Factories at the start of the game are really uh, to thank for that victory. Okay, finding a thicket at least. Finding a meek stone. So maybe, maybe, but it's... I think I'm still dead next turn. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to... He's going to ping me for one with the trike. Then in his upkeep, I'm going to tap down his factory again. Uh, let's see what's going to happen. Oh, paralyzed. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's game number one. Game number one in the bag here for Joe. Well done. Really thanks to those aggressive mistress factories. Uh, we are going to go dive into our sideboards and hopefully we get to see some living lands and some animating going on in game number two. Game number two and uh, yeah, at least I'm on the play. That's something positive. Hopefully I can find like a lot of our elves early. You can get some Thicket Basilisks on the board. And let's hope that Joe cannot find, um, you know, any Mistress Factories early in the game that I can have some breathing space. But we'll just have to see. And I kind of remember uh, Joe telling me, you haven't seen my deck yet. Uh, because remember, we don't know each other's decks, of course, uh, before these matchups. And uh, it's true. I haven't really seen your deck yet, Joe. Like game one, uh, you were just swinging in with your Mistress Factories very, very successfully. I might add, you've won the game fair and square. But I haven't seen your whole reanimator plan. So hopefully in game number two, we can see that. And I can also kind of show... Uh, to everybody what my deck is about. We'll just have to see. Sometimes that happens in Magic. You have a whole deck idea and um, yeah, you end up not really drawing the right cards. And there is a forest on my side passing turn here, a basic island from Joe passing to turn back. There's another forest. Okay, again, a Sylvan Library. So I am quite lucky with the Sylvans, only playing two main. And in both matches, I'm able, both games, I'm able to play one at turn two. And there is a City of Brass by Joe. Let's see what he's going to do here. Perhaps playing a Felwer Stone that we saw in game one. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank. Contemplating what he wants to do. Going through his cards. And okay, deciding to go for the Mind Bomb. So I talked about this a little bit in the deck deck. Very interesting card. One blue to cast. Deals three damage to each player but what you can do is you can actually discard a card to prevent one damage and you can do that up to three cards so if you want to you can prevent all the damage i'm taking the three damage going to 17 and look at that wow joe's discarding two trikes and i think we're very close to seeing his reanimator plan getting into action so that is really cool so if uh joe now has an animate dead uh he can get one of his trikes back and have a turn uh, three trike on a battlefield. So there is a Pendlehaven and a Wailuli Wolf. And there is the anime dead. Does take a damage from his own City of Brass. And that Triskelion is now a 3-4. Because remember, anime dead takes one point of power off of your creature. So it's a 3-4 creature. And maybe you're thinking, why isn't he just killing the Wailuli Wolf? Well, the problem is that I can pump the Wailuli Wolf with the Pendlehaven. So in that case, he would kind of trade all the counters for one by Lulu Wolf. And I guess he doesn't want to do that. So it's going to be interesting to see what he's going to do. First, let's see what I'm going to do with my turn. Played out another forest. And it looks like I'm just passing turn here. There is a swamp attacking with a 3-4. And I, I guess I can block. Okay, so, oh, look, what am I doing? I'm first pumping it with the Pendlehaven, asking him if he wants to respond. He says no, and then I'm playing the Giant Grove in that order. And interestingly enough, what he could do here, I think, is respond by killing my wolf. Okay, I guess he's not. He's deciding to deal three damage to me, so I'm going to go to 14. But then again, I guess I could have used the my own Willy Wolf to make it into a 3-4 then, so it still would survive. Yeah, so I think this was the right play here by uh, by my opponent, Joe. It is kind of difficult. Like, well, Louis Wolf, Pendlehaven, Giant Grove, all those cards make <laughs> make the math a little bit complicated. So there is a Felwer Stone uh, by Joe. Interesting that he taps his City of Brass to cast that Felwer Stone because he also has a Swamp over there. 
And he's now on 17. I'm on 14. And okay, playing out a demonic tutor. I believe this is a French demonic tutor, by the way. And uh, yeah, he's going to find a card. Is it going to be like an anime dead again? Does he want to get a trike back? I wonder what he's going to look up. Maybe a mind twist? Yuck. But yeah, maybe. I mean, it would be kind of a good decision, I guess. He could twist me for four next turn. Anyway, I'm sure I have that in the back of my head thinking, okay, maybe he's looked up a mind twist. I really need to play out something here. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Playing out a cockatrice, the 2-4 flying for 5, and passing turn here. Not attacking with my Waluli Wolf, so choosing to keep that plus 1, plus 1 pump option open. So I am still a little bit wary of him playing an anime dead over a trike. Really interesting what he's going to do. So there's a maze of if. Oh man, that maze. That's going to make it difficult for me to deal any damage. I don't really have anything against the maze. Anime dead. Oh, the trike's coming back. Is he going to kill the wolf? I mean, now he can kill the wolf. Remember, the wolf can tap itself to make it a 2-2. Uh, it looks like I already wanted to untap, so we're kind of in a frozen moment here. I thought Joe said pass, so I'm sorry for that, and started untapping already. Uh, but Joe decides not to do anything uh, with the uh, White Lily Wolf, deciding to let it be. And I guess for me, attacking right now is not really beneficial, so I'm just passing turn. And okay, he's playing a paralyze. Okay, there's a little glitch on the line, but he's playing a paralyze over my cockatrice. So the cockatrice is now tapped down. And okay, he's attacking right now with the 3 4. Yeah, what I can do, of course, I can make it into a 2 3. It can tap itself into a 3 4, and then it's just, yeah, it blocks each other. And after damage is dealt, he can actually kill it with one counter. I wonder if that's what he's going to do. Because the damage stays for the entire turn. So it means you deal... Like a use Pendlehaven, make it into a 2-3. Then the way Louis Wolf taps itself, make it into a 3-4. So 3-4 against 3-4. So both play, uh, creatures live. But then, of course, in his second main, he could kill it. I think, oh, my twist. Take away my last two cards, including Living Lands. Living Lands, not really a great card against all those trikes on the board. That's probably why I kept it in hand. Ah, but that, um, that Mixo would have been nice. So using my four forests to untap my Cockatrice here. And there is a Lanawer Elf. And the board is, we're kind of at a standstill at the moment, it seems. It makes no sense for him to attack at this point. Let's see what he's going to do. Looking at his... Well, he's not looking at his card. He's thinking, it seems. Two cards in hand still. I'm all out of cards thanks to that mind twist. And this is difficult. I mean, I think attacking is not an option for him. Don't know what he has in hand, of course. Looking at my three again, and oh, this is a good card. Came in from the sideboard, Tonus's Coffin. I can pay three and tap to put target creature in the coffin, so I can put the Triskelion into the coffin. I probably don't want to do that right now, because it means I will have to tap down my Pendlehaven, and then I'm giving an opening to Crouton Man here to kill one of my 1-1s. One I don't want that to happen. So I'm probably going to wait another turn. And then I'm going to put his creature in the box and I'm probably just going to attack with everything I have to at least deal some damage. Taking a damage here. Oh, Dance of Many. This is unexpected. Remember, I've got uh, Tonus' Coffin on the board. And if I put a token in the coffin, it just disappears. It doesn't come back. So I'm not sure if Joe realizes this. So let's just see what's going to happen. Maybe he anticipated on it. And there are no counters on there, so I believe he copied my cockatrice here. 
playing a soul ring. I wonder what I'm going to do. If I'm going to put it straight away into, into the coffin, I don't have to straight away at least. Tapping down the mana, taking a damage for his own city of brass. What can he do here? Choosing to attack with both, that's quite interesting. So I'm probably going to use my coffin here. And I'm using my coffin on the token. And I kind of remember, Joe, you're saying, oh man, I forgot about the coffin. The thing is, he forgot that you can also use the coffin against your creatures of your opponent. So that's where kind of the thinking went flawed here. And of course, that is a huge advantage for me because I can put the token into the box. It disappears. I can now use my cockatrice to uh, block the Triskelion. And he's now thinking, what can I do? Like his whole attack, he could still use the maze to take the trike out of combat, chooses not to, and this just ends up to be a whole bunch, like you could basically say this whole combat phase is, is dramatic here for my opponent, Joe, because he loses both of his creatures. Uh, you know, he didn't realize that I could use that Taunus' coffin that way. And he's basically kind of given me the victory here, I believe, in game number two. I mean, still got a maze out. I mean, I still don't have any cards in hand, like one card now. Um, but hey, now at least I've got some, some creatures on board, and he's going to use going to be forced to kind of use the maze on probably the cockatrice, right? And okay, he's going to use it on the Waluli Wolf, and he's going to take some damage. Interesting here is that I'm not using my Pendlehaven or my Waluli Wolf to pump my Lanawar Elf. I'm probably still a little bit, um, a little bit concerned about animate deaths and trikes and stuff, that I want to keep those, those pump spells, Pendlehaven and... Um, well, Louis Wolf untapped. I am playing another Thicket Basilisk, so more bad news here for for my opponent, uh, Crouton Man. Seems to be a little glitch here with the line. And it looks like we're back. Okay, we're back, and I guess he passed turn, because I'm, yeah, I'm untapping right now, paying the four, of course, because there's still that uh, Paralyze on my Cockatrice. But I've got enough mana now, attacking with the whole team. He's untapping the thicket. I think that's a good decision. Again, I'm not using the Pendlehaven. Going to drop to seven. I think I should just use that Pendlehaven. Be a bit more aggressive. I mean, he's low on life, right? Just playing very cautious here. Uh, attacking again. And I really think that that one combat step where he overlooked at Tansa's coffin, that made all the difference here in game number two. And I guess the positive thing about that is that we are going to see a game number three, or maybe he can find a balance. Balance can actually get him out of this. Would put him on one. He does play with one balance in his deck. That would be super, super spectacular. He's looking at his hands. Maybe he's got a balance. Who knows? Going through his cards. Then again, if he had a balance, he probably would have played it out already. It's kind of a no-brainer in the current situation. Going to go on one, just tapping six for a Tetravis. Just wanting to do at least one more thing, and I, yeah. He's all tapped out. I'm going to untap my Cockatrice again. I'm probably just going to attack with the whole four second. Yeah, I used the coffin, put the Tetravis in the coffin, and just attack with everything. And uh, yeah, finish game uh, number two here. And like I said before, it uh, it was really because of that one combat step. I mean, I think without without that moment in the game, I'm not saying I wouldn't have won it, uh, but the game would have been completely different. The positive thing though is that we are getting a game number three, so I'm looking forward to that. So let's go to game three and, uh, and let's see who is going to win this match. Is it going to be a Rise of the Machines or will it be my Meekstone Green? Let's go. Game number three, the big decider. Who's going to win, Crouton Man or me? Let's see. It's Joe, of course, on the play, starting with a Mind Bomb, and this is exactly what he wants to do, so I'm going to drop to 17. He gets to drop some big creatures in his bin. In this case, it's one Triskelion there. I mean, can he find... Does he also have an Animate, right? That's the first question you've got to have in, in the back of your mind. Does he have an Animate dead turn two here? At least a good opening for me. Finding that Lanawar Elves. Uh, that's what you want to do when you're the green player. 
And tapping. Oh, Sage of Latinam. I really thought it was going to be an anime that, you know, tapping down a black and a blue there. Uh, but I'm lucky here that he doesn't find it. Playing a Sage of Latinam 1 2 creature from Antiquities. And there's a tracker. That's bad news for the Sage of Latinam. Sage of Latinam, so a 1 2, you can tap and you can sacrifice one of your artifacts to draw a card. So. Not that relevant at the moment. And look at this. This is actually quite nice using the Paralyze. And that is going to save his Sage of Latinam, at least for now. Remember, Paralyze means I have to pay four mana to untap the creature during my upkeep. So that's pretty steep. Playing double Wailuli Wolf here. And I think the Wailuli Wolves are just really, really powerful against uh, the Trike, right? Because the Trike is just so good against all these 1-1s. One -ones. But the Wailuli Wolf is kind of forcing uh, Joe to use that extra plus one plus one counter per Wailuli Wolf activation. And it's kind of annoying. That's not what you want to do when you have the trike. Attacking with one wolf. He's choosing not to block it. And I have untapped my tracker, by the way. That's why those uh, the Lanawar Elf and the other three forests are tapped. So that's to untap my tracker. And I guess next turn I can then kill the Sage of Latinam. Taking a damage from... The City of Brass playing a regrowth here. Interesting. Playing a regrowth over the trike. That's not really what Joe wants to do, but I guess he just can't find an enemy dead or a Hell's Caretaker. Would be really sweet to see a Hell's Caretaker in this game. I think it's just such a cool card. But we're not seeing it yet. At least we've got the tracker on the battlefield playing another forest. I'm mean, going to use the tracker here to kill the Sage. I, I think I think I should do it. Looks like I'm a little bit in the tank here. Maybe I have a lot of options. I've got five mana. You know, I could also play out a Thicket Basilisk, a Cockatrice. I mean, there are just a lot of cards. Choosing to activate the Tracker here. So remember, Tracker, uh, two green and tap. And then it deals damage equal to its power to target creature. And it also takes the damage back equal to the power of that creature. So in this case, Tracker is a 2-2. Two -two, deals two damage to Sage of Latinam. Sage of Latinam just deals one damage back. And um, since the tracker has two toughness, it doesn't die. Oh, there is a Triskelion. And now it's going to be interesting. What is Joe going to do? I guess I guess when you're Joe, you just use it as a blocker in this situation. And it is very interesting. Deciding not to untap the tracker, by the way. Instead, playing a Thicket Basilisk. And Thicket is just kind of ideal against uh, the trike, especially with those two Wailuli Wolves there. I mean, Thicket has four toughness, so the Trike cannot touch it. And it's just this annoying creature. You don't want to block the Thicket because it means you're going to lose your creature. And playing a Felwer Stone here. And I think the Felwer Stone just would have been great. Also with the Sage, you could just sack the Felwer to draw a card. Same thing goes for the Trike. You could take the counters off and then sack the Trike to draw a card with the Sage. So I am pretty pleased with myself that I decided to to kill the Sage instead of playing the Thicket uh, the turn before. Attacking here with the Thicket Basilisk, 2-4. Remember, I can pump it up. Probably deciding not to because if I use my Wailulu Wolves at the wrong moment, I'm giving an opening to the Crouton Man to use his plus one, plus one counters from the Trike to kill some of my creatures. So that's not what I want to do. So I'm just going to keep my Wolves nice, nicely untapped so I can respond to anything that Joe wants to do with those plus one, plus one counters. Tapping four here for an Icy Manipulator. Attacking here with uh, both the Thicket and the uh, the Tracker, dealing four damage. Ooh, playing a Meek Stone here. So this is going to be difficult. Now Joe has to decide, am I going to use some of my plus one, plus one counters to try to kill, for example, the Wailuli Wolf? I mean, he can pay three, right? He can kill a Wolf, and then he can untap the uh the triskelion but does he really want to do that does he want to use up all his three counters just to kill one of the one one creatures i think it's actually not that bad of a decision i mean it is it is this is kind of a catch-22 right like both decisions are not ideal but does he really want to keep the triskelion tap maybe you can let me know in the comments below what you would do in this situation it looks like joe is deciding to keep his trike tapped. Of course, it does depend on what do you have in hand. And we don't know that. He's got three cards in hand. We, we simply don't know what he has. But let me know what you would do without really thinking about what he could, could have in his, in his hand. There's another Felwer Stone, so that's not really going to do much. 
going to untap everything. This is a great scenario for me deciding not to untap the tracker, it seems, or am I? Okay, I am untapping the tracker here. That means I can now just attack with the Lanor Elves, the Thicket, and the tracker dealing five damage. And he's on three. Wow. Very low on life. And I'm being extremely patient here with those Wailudi Wolves. And I think this is kind of over here for Joe. Again, a balance would kind of get him back. Untapping the tracker again. He needs a small miracle here, I feel. Attacking with everything. except Again, except for the Wolves. <laughs> really keeping them untapped until the end of the game. Yeah, he's dealing me three more damage, but he's saying, okay, man, you've got this one. Okay, this was the match of today. I think it was quite interesting. Also really nice to see Joe's uh, budget reanimator deck. Really cool. I'm also kind of pleased uh, with uh, with my uh, Meekstone Green, especially with those Wailuli Wolves. I think they were kind of the MVPs of especially this game number three. It's just really difficult when you've got a trike on the table and you're facing two Wailuli Wolves. It's really hard then to, to decide what's a good moment to use the trike, you know, and should I use it at all? Should I use it ability or just keep it a 4-4? Those are, of course, the big questions. Okay, so this is the match of today. Thank you very much for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. Let me know what you think about the decks, about our plays. Always love to hear from you and you're helping the channel with a comment, by the way. So every comment you post, it helps the channel grow. Also, leaving a like is really appreciated. Becoming a sub, that's all really helping the channel move forward. And it's all for you, free for you to do. Talking about um, how you can help the channel, you can also become a patron. And you can do that by clicking on the card that's appearing right now. That will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And you can already support Timmy Talks starting at $1 a month. So if it's something for you, click uh, on the info card and have a look you know maybe it's something for you maybe not and then just click it away it's all good talking about patrons uh let's take a look at the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic amazing channel members and patrons of timmy talks what shall we do with the Ik het als fik het als somba kazik.